I'd like to welcome all of you to the 33rd Lady Masson Lecture hosted by the Melbourne University Chemical Society or what we call MUCS. I would like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the lands of the Boon Wurrung people and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians from the various lands on which all of you are on. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of the Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of all of Australia. I next want to welcome the Masson family um, and I would like to particularly welcome uh, Sally Bassett, who is Lady Masson's granddaughter. And perhaps uh, um, Sally has shared the link with other uh, Masson families and uh, members, and I'm not sure who they might be, but whoever you are, I welcome you warmly uh, to this uh, Mux lecture. So I'm going to share my screen again and say a few words about the history of uh, our society and also about the uh, um, Lady Masson lecture itself. So we're very lucky today to have a very um, timely lecture by Professor Sharon Lewin and um, uh, Professor, uh, Associate Professor Guy Jamison, who's president of the Mux Society will actually be presenting uh, uh, Sharon. But I wanted to say a few words about our Melbourne University Chemical Society. Um, it is the first university chemical society in Australia. It was established way back in 1903 by Professor David Orr Masson. And MUX has been held, uh, ha have been having meetings every year since its inception, inception in 1903. Today's lecture is numbered 1083. And we are actually living in a difficult time at the moment with COVID-19, but there has been difficulties in the past over 100 years. There was the Spanish flu, uh, there were two world wars, and during that time, MUX kept on going. And so it's, it's great that we are able to keep this tradition going, albeit in a different way in this uh, Zoom uh, webinar format. So because we've been going for over 100 years, there's a wonderful book uh, that was written by Volder McRae, which I showed on that previous slide, that uh, lists all of the lectures that were given uh, ever since Mux was founded. And so uh, this is, if anyone's who's interested in history, you can dip into that and you can say, well, what was happening way back in October of uh, 1920? What lecture was being given then? And it turns out that uh, the lecture being given then was by Professor um, David Orr Masson on the constitution of the atom. Uh, that was back in the 1920s where they still hadn't yet uh, come up with the name of the proton. And remarkably, uh, uh, Professor uh, Masson uh, was actually giving a lecture on the constitution of the atom and actually coming up with a proposal for the name of the proton. Um, and uh, this work, he then used this lecture, the notes that he had to write it up as a paper, which was uh, then published the year later. And uh, we'll say more about that uh, in a little while. Let's. Uh, talk about the Masson family apart from be, uh, uh, having uh, um, a, a professor of chemistry who made so many influential uh, contributions to modern and Australian society. Of course, supporting him in every way was Lady Masson, who is a remarkable woman in her own right. She was the fourth of seven children, uh, to a daughter to a professor of anatomy uh, in Melbourne. Uh, after she had reared all of her uh, uh, children, she dedicated herself into uh, community work. She was the foundation member of the Victoria League, the New Settlers League, the CWA Australia. She was president of the university branch of Australian Red Cross during those difficult First World War years. And she was executive member of the Australian Comforts Fund, which was set up to um, help um, war widows and other uh, relatives of uh, servicemen. It's for that magnificent work, selfless dedication she had to community work that she was appointed a CBE in 1918. 
Uh, um, there's a very nice article on the Australian Dictionary Biography, and I borrowed um, some of uh, these words from this article in terms of trying to describe uh, what Lady Masson was like. It, we were told that she was of diminutive stature, which combines well with a pleasant air of authority and purpose. I think the next point is quite remarkable. She had this gift of creating harmony amongst men and women of diverging points of view and widening the lives of people lonely in unfamiliar settings. So if there, whenever there was a new hire in chemistry, um, you know, she made, went out of her way to make sure that that person connected with the rest of the university community. Uh, she was valuable in, uh, uh, valuable in organising and she used that uh, with tact and imagination. So she was very diplomatic in the way she went about organising things. And although she had uh, no formal scientific tra uh, training, she was a regular attendee of uh, the meetings of the Melbourne University Chemical Society and she maintained that long after her husband's death. So she had this really deep connection with the School of Chemistry and uh, I guess she regarded chemistry as her family. Um, and uh, to highlight the deep respect and regard that the whole of the university ha community had for Lady Masson, on the day she died, all of the flags across the university were flying at half mast. So she was definitely uh, a formidable woman and, a, uh, uh, and did amazing work around uh, the university and in the community. And it's because of this uh, um, amazing work that she did that the Melbourne University Chemical Society uh, established a fund uh, to uh, um, uh, pay for the lectures that have been given now for more than uh, 50 years. So, of course, uh, um, th we've had many, many exciting lectures over, uh, it's, it's held uh, every two years, these lectures, and we've had many diverse lecturers from all sorts of walks of life. It's not just been chemists. We've had politicians give talks. Uh, we've had Nobel laureates give talks. We've had radio presenters give talks on all sorts of matters that are of general interest because this is meant to be a general interest lecture. Um, and as I said, uh, the funds for um, the Lady Masson lecture were set up uh, many, many years ago. And unfortunately, they've dwindled away over the years. So uh, my predecessor, Professor Evan Beeske, set up the Masson Fund to help um, uh, uh, promote these sort of events, such as the one that we're having today. Um, and uh, the details of that fund, as you can see, are on this page. Um, so um, I'm going to hand over now to Guy to say a few words uh, as president of uh, Melbourne University Chemical Society. Guy, could you say a few words now? Hello, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so my name is Guy Jameson. I'm an associate professor in the School of Chemistry and it's my honor to be the president of MUX uh, at this present time. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sharon Lewin. She is the inaugural director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, which is a joint venture between the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital. She's a laureate professor within the University of Melbourne and also a consultant physician in infectious diseases at the Alfred Hospital and Royal Melbourne Hospital as well as being a National Health and Medical Research Council Practitioner Fellow. Uh, she's an elected member of the Governing Council of the International AIDS Society. And uh, in 2014, she was named Melbourneian of the Year, and 2019 was made an Officer of the Order of Australia. And so it gives me a great pleasure to introduce her and um, to this uh, meeting 1,083, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Guy, for the um, lovely introduction. And I'll just get my slides up here. And um, first of all, thank you to the um, Melbourne University Chemical Society for um, inviting me to give this lecture. In fact, I met Richard 
in February of this year at the leadership conference for um, the University of Melbourne um, at a meeting in Torquay and I came down for the evening to talk about this exotic virus in China and I don't think any of us it was already impacting the university at that time with no students arriving but I don't think any of us really imagined that we would be in the position that we're in right now um, back in February. So um, thank you, Richard, for inviting me to give the talk. And um, thank you, Guy, for the uh, introduction and your help in, in getting here. So I also um, found the same um, photograph of Lady Masson on the internet. There weren't many other photographs of her. I was very inspired by her story and also by the legacy of this lecture and uh, wonderful to have some of the Masson family in the audience today. I understand that the lectures um, actually started in 1949 and um, as we sit here in 2020 in what has been an extraordinary year for everyone, um, I was thinking about infectious diseases at that time whether at 1945 on Lady Masson's death or 1949 when um, this lectureship first started. I came across a wonderful quote from Sir McFarlane Burnett um, that I'm sure many of you know of. Um, he was the previous director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research and the co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1960. So a very smart man, but he said, uh, one can think of the middle of the 20th century as the end of one of the most important social revolutions in history, the virtual elimination of infectious diseases as a significant factor in social life. So he was a very smart man, but God, did he get that wrong as we sit here um, in the most significant pandemic that um, any of us have experienced. So I started my career um, studying medicine, actually at Monash University in the 1980s. And um, this was the infectious disease that we were most worried about back then, um, an exotic new virus starting in Africa. Um, and this is the number of infectious diseases uh, that we now worry about. And this was published in 2017. So there's been a few since then, including COVID-19. And so what I want to talk about today is a, um, a bit about HIV, given I've spent my entire career uh, working in that, on that virus, um, a little bit about how that pandemic is not quite over and still has quite a few challenges. And then switch to COVID-19 and talk about how much we've learnt in just such a short time and some lessons uh, I think that it will be important for both viruses. So when I started medicine, and many of you in the audience, I think will know this photograph. I find when I talk to medical students now, no one knows the Grim Reaper. But in 1987, a very famous um, campaign in Australia um, for HIV identified um, or characterised HIV as grim and stigmatised and a universal death sentence. And this was very much the face of HIV when I started my training um, as a young doctor. But this is the face of HIV for me now. Um, this is part of a public campaign with these sorts of posters all around actually um, um, inner Sydney around ending HIV, where people really think that HIV, it's in our sights to see the end of HIV. And this is through a range of interventions, um, testing more, um, treating early and staying safe or protecting ourselves from HIV. And I wanna talk about some of the enormous advances that we've seen in treatment. Um, and I wanna use this as a way of um, sort of illustrating to you how much we can do for an infectious disease without a vaccine. Um, even though we're all hoping for a vaccine for COVID-19 and I suspect we will have one, we still don't have one for HIV, but yet the, the disease and how we um, manage HIV has been absolutely transformed literally by our testing strategies and treatment strategies. And in the second half of the talk, I'll, I'll talk a bit about COVID-19, where we are now and what we might expect from the science in the future. So this is HIV treatment at its beginning in 1996 on the left and what how we treat HIV now in 2020. So treatment's highly effective. It was very complicated in the mid 90s, many different drugs needed, many side effects. 
um, quite often seeing drug resistance and difficult to access. Treatment was only really available in rich countries. On the right is the treatment that we use now. It's much the same whether you live in Australia or Cambodia or Uganda. It's one tablet a day, which usually has two or three antiviral um, medications. And treatment continues to get better and better. Um, in the next year or so, we're, more, we're likely to see injectable treatment for HIV. It won't be suitable for everyone, but for some people, they'll receive an injection once a month or once every two months. We, know, we might no longer even use drugs, we'll use antibodies, actually very, very relevant to some of the advances in COVID-19. And using antibodies means we might be able to deliver treatment once every six months. And there's even work on implants of antiretrovirals. So people might just have a patch that's applied um, or an implant once a year. Advances of treatment have been extraordinary. But what's been unique about HIV is that treatment has been accessible to the whole world. Um, and this has been a product of not just science, but incredible advocacy, largely from people living with HIV and also great leadership. Um, in fact, one of the major leaders in making treatment available globally was the US, in fact, in a very different era, um, George W. Bush created a fund which um, uh, supports uh, $6 billion a year to go to um, low and middle income countries for access to treatment. So in 2020, uh, we have over 26 million people on antiretroviral therapy. That's about 60% of the world's population. Um, and uh, so this has been an extraordinary um, outcome. But treatment's not perfect. And um, this is why we still need a cure for HIV. And that's largely the work that um, most of my scientific career has been focused on. We still we need a cure for HIV because first of all, there still is an extraordinary amount of stigma that exists for people living with HIV. So being on long-term treatment doesn't seem to eliminate the stigma. There is toxicity from antiretroviral therapy or ART. Not everyone can access antiretroviral therapy. As I mentioned, only 60% of the world's population is on treatment, but 40% can't access it. And cost is a really big issue. Um, the estimated cost to treat everyone living with HIV with a target goal of 2030 is about $30 billion a year. We currently pay about $20 billion a year for access to treatment. But where is that money going to come from long term? And um, in, the condition, in the situation that we're in currently, this is even at greater risk. So treatment access is actually fragile. It's not guaranteed. And even just in the six months that we've had COVID-19 spreading across our world, there's been significant disruptions with access to treatment. So when you um, uh, put people on treatment for HIV, uh, we can measure the amount of virus that's in blood very easily. Um, we call this the viral load. You can literally count the copies per mil of virus. And on average, people will have hundreds of thousands, million copies per mil of blood. And as soon as they go on to treatment, that virus rapidly disappears um, to what we call undetectable levels, um, or less than 20 copies per mil happens pretty much in everyone within about three to four weeks of starting modern day ART. But unfortunately, treatment is not a cure. And um, in pretty much everyone, as soon as they stop antiretroviral therapy, um, virus rapidly returns, usually within about two to three weeks. And this is because the treatment suppresses virus replication, but it never gets rid of it completely. And if you had very sensitive tests, you can always measure low levels of virus in anyone on treatment. And the reason why um, virus persists is that there, it can persist in this silent form or something we call latent infection. So I know there's um, mainly chemists in the audience and um, some of the general public as well. So I don't want to get too much into the virology, but just so you understand that the HIV mainly infect, once it infects a cell, it gets integrated into someone's DNA. And then the virus starts making copies of itself and then it produces uh, viruses and kills the cell. This is called productive infection and this happens Oh, again and again and again um, in people that are off treatment. And um, once you put people on treatment, this life cycle is stopped. 
But HIV has this very clever, and actually many viruses have this other technique tool of becoming latent, meaning that the virus is integrated into the host DNA, into someone's genetic material, but is actually silenced and therefore not recognisable by the immune system. And I'll talk a bit more about COVID-19, but COVID-19 doesn't have a, this sort of form of latent infection, but many other viruses do. So when we want to cure people, or when we start talking about ways to cure people, we have this pool of lately infected cells that hang around indefinitely in people on treatment. And one approach is if we could eliminate every single one of those cells, we think this is probably impossible, and you could eventually eradicate virus from someone's body. But more likely, what we might be able to achieve is to shrink that number of infected cells and then bolster the immune system to stop the virus from rebounding. And this might allow for something that we call remission. You'll be familiar with that concept in cancer where you might have extremely low levels um, or, of virus or maybe even cancer, um, but you, it hasn't actually reactivated. So this is the two things that are now a really big focus of science globally, either eradicating virus completely or inducing remission so that people aren't locked into long-term treatment. And um, HIV can be cured. It's very rare, but it can be cured. And the first person cured of HIV was um, this man, Timothy Brown. He was originally called the Berlin patient. He had HIV and acute myeloid leukemia, and he needed a bone marrow transplant to cure his leukemia. And his doctor, he's American, but his doctor living in Berlin at the time thought, what about if I give Timothy a transplant from a donor who's naturally resistant to HIV? About 1% of the world are naturally resistant to HIV because they lack the receptor that HIV needs to enter a cell called CCR5. So Timothy Brown received a CCR5 negative bone marrow, stopped his antiviral therapy and was cured. His virus never returned. Um, and he did lived extremely well actually for 11 years. Unfortunately, he died just a month ago um, with recurrence of his leukemia. For many years, people thought, didn't, you know, this actually galvanised the field because people began, people, people at, that, at this time back in 2009 thought cure was impossible. If the virus becomes part of your DNA, you can never get rid of it. But this proved cure was possible. The, the challenge was which part of what happened to Timothy Brown was relevant and was this just a one-off? And then um, just last year, another man was reported to be cured of HIV. His name's Adam Castileo. He lives in London. He also received a bone marrow transplant from a donor that was CCR5 negative, this time for Hodgkin's disease. And he remains off treatment now for three years. And just six months ago, we learned about another pathway to a cure. This is Lorraine Willenberg. She's from San Francisco. She's never been on treatment but somehow her immune system has managed to eliminate all of HIV other than a few remnants or defective forms. And this is, I was a very exciting discovery and maybe a new pathway to cure. And finally, about five to 10% of people, um, if they are treated early, usually within about six months of infection, seem to be able to stop the, their antiretroviral therapy, never it, it completely clear the virus, but keep it under control or in remission. And this has also given us lots of clues that the immune system is going to be important in one day achieving a cure. But to be honest, this is it. So out of the 37 million people living with HIV, this is really, really rare but it's possible. And as I said earlier, um, these observations have given us hope that a cure is possible and something that the scientific community needs to keep working towards. So pretty much any of the strategies that are being tested are tar targeting the virus to try and shrink it and boosting the immune system. This is a list of some of the ways that people are trying to shrink the reservoir and a list of some of the ways that um, are being tried to boost the immune system. Now, um, we know that if you do this, it can work, at least in monkey models, and there's been a range of reports of different combinations of shrinking the reservoir and boosting immunity, allowing long-term control or even cure in some monkey studies. 
And now the work that I've been focused on for many years is to see if we can get rid of latent infection by converting it into productive infection, something called latency reversal or shocking the virus and then hoping that the cell then dies. And we've been doing this with something called latency reversing agents. And um, the goal is that once you reverse latency, these cells will die and may, they may need a bit of help with some immune boosting or drugs that boost apoptosis or cell death. And we know we can do this safely in people. We've done clinical trials of this sort of intervention um, because when we do this latency reversal, we do it in people who are on treatment so the virus can't go on to infect new cells. And over the last few years, we've worked on many different latency reversing agents. With it. We have lots of them that work in test tube models. We've done clinical trials of a number of these and shown we can reverse latency in people, but those cells don't die. And so the focus of our work currently and many others around the world is trying to get better delivery of these drugs. And we're working closely with actually the Department of Chemical Engineering um, of bioengineering um, with Frank Caruso, de delivering these drugs using nanoparticles, trying to find new targets using combinations of drugs and then using drugs that also induce cell death. Now, at the same time, we're very interested to see whether we can boost the immune system, learning from major advances in cancer immunotherapy. Traditionally, cancer therapies poison the cancer, but recent therapies focus on boosting the immune system and they've worked extraordinarily well. They really wonder drugs in certain types of cancers. And these, um, this sort of immunotherapy we think is highly relevant to HIV. And that's because these latently infected cells um, express these, these what we call exhaustion markers that cancer immunotherapy targets. And just like in cancer, the immune system in people with HIV is also exhausted and can be boosted with immunotherapy. So we're very involved in studying this sort of cancer immunotherapy, actually in HIV positive people with cancer who are receiving this treatment for their cancer. And it allows us to study whether these drugs can also boost the immune system to target the HIV reservoir. Now, another way that's being actively um, pursued for um, a cure for HIV is gene therapy. I don't work on this directly myself, but I, had to, I felt I had to mention it this year, especially because the leaders in gene therapy, um, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, were actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020, just three weeks ago. And they won, it was wonderful, of course, two women winning the Nobel Prize. There's not many of them out there. And they won the Nobel Prize because they discovered how to do this sort of gene editing using a tool called CRISPR, which are basically gene scissors that can very accurate, accurately recognise parts, um, parts of the DNA and, and disrupt it. And this is a, a really exciting area in HIV cure. And um, the reason is because there's lots of ways we could tackle cure using gene therapy. And we can use it to attack, protect or purge the virus. And um, people are using gene therapy to enhance the anti-HIV immune response. What I was mentioning before, like we're doing with immunotherapy, you can do it with gene therapy. You can actually engineer cells to, be, to make them resistant to HIV or protect. This was inspired by Timothy Brown, the Berlin patient, because you can actually eliminate the receptor for HIV or CCR5. Or you can purge the virus. You can actually directly eliminate the virus itself. I told you HIV gets woven into a person's DNA and you can actually target it directly. And this is all happening in test tube models, in monkey models, and even in clinical trials. The real challenge for gene therapy is delivering it to people um, because uh, how do you get the gene into the cell you, where you want it to go? And that's done either by editing the cells outside the body or what's called ex vivo gene therapy or editing the cells in the body, what's called in vivo gene editing. And at, at these clinical trials are already happening in HIV. This is an example of one. This is a person living with HIV on treatment, doing pretty well, normal life expectancy, 
get who had who had a lot of cells um, collected from the body ex vivo the cells are modified using these scissors to remove ccr5 the receptor for hiv the ccr5 negative cells are then reinfused and survive um, in this person not at to, so far we haven't been able to get these levels to a very high level that they can safely stop their treatment but they survive and it's safe and there's a lot of work now in trying to make this better and more efficient and there's even in vivo gene therapy where you can inject someone with either a nanoparticle or a virus to express the gene you want and this is being done to deliver long-term antibody so what sounds like super complex medicine um, may one day um, be actually available, we hope, in low-income countries, just like antiretroviral therapy is currently available. And there's intense interest in these gene therapy approaches. So just if I think about the future for HIV and will we ever see an end to HIV, at the moment we're here in 2020, we have outstanding treatment um, uh, with which people take, 60% of the world is taking these life-saving therapies. I'd say as early as next year, we will see long-acting treatments, injections, maybe once every two or every month or every two months. And in the next five years, potentially you, the use of antibodies allowing us to give treatment every six months, which would be an extraordinary advance. People often ask me when we might have a cure for HIV. I still think that will be decades away, but we have a plan of what that might look like. Um, initially, it will be complicated with combination immunotherapy, maybe only inducing remission. Eventually, I'm sure we will get um, ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy into the clinic and even into low income countries. And the holy grail ultimately is to get some sort of single shot cure um, that will actually eliminate HIV. And there's a lot of people working towards that. So in 2018, the front page of the cover of The Economist had the title, The End of AIDS. Um, here we are uh, um, uh, many years later. Um, I think the end of AIDS is possible. We can certainly stop people dying from HIV just with availability of treatment. But if you really want to see the end of HIV, um, more work will be needed in a cure and also um, eventually a need for a vaccine. So I want to switch now and talk about COVID-19 um, and give you an update of what the role the Doherty Institute has played, um, what to expect from the science in our road to recovery, and then trying to draw some parallels between COVID-19 and HIV and lessons for both viruses. So the Doherty Institute, as you heard from Guy's introduction, was pretty much built for a pandemic response. Um, the Institute, as you heard, is a joint venture of the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital. And it's pretty unique in Australia because it brings together research, um, education and public health. Public health often gets squirreled away um, from the research components. And many years ago, about a decade ago, um, pretty much um, a number of people at the University of Melbourne, particularly Jim McCluskey, Mike Catton and others, had the vision to bring together different parts of the university and Royal Melbourne Hospital that work in infectious diseases, put them in a lovely brand new building, which was actually built as a result of the global financial crisis when they were looking for shovel ready projects. And the building went up in record time, opened in 2014 and brought together about 700 people that work across the spectrum on infectious diseases. And although we've been doing fabulous work, of course, for the last six years, um, it was really this pandemic that put um, the, 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 the vision and the dream to the test. And I think we did you know, really extraordinarily well for a number of reasons. Um, a, we had the extensive capabilities. B, we got going extremely quickly. Um, as soon as the coronavirus was identified in China and the sequence available on January the 10th, um, people got working on this January the 11th. And um, the Doherty Institute's vision has been to improve health globally through discovery research, treatment, prevention and cure of infectious diseases. And we work on many infectious diseases, um, old ones and new ones, but now about 50% of our staff have turned their efforts towards COVID. And we've had some really fantastic wins. Um, the 
Institute was the first to isolate and share the virus outside of China. That was a very big deal back on January the 29th when no one else had access to the virus, done by Mike Catton, the deputy, uh, de my deputy director, and Julian Drews. And um, we've been working on mathematical models and to inform the Australian and Victorian government response. And I think everyone now knows um, or thinks of themselves as a, some type of epidemiologist. You've got all sorts of views on, on what, you know, the curve and waves and crushing the waves and what to expect. Everyone's got a view, but this largely came from work led by Jody McVernon, who's head of epidemiology. Um, we were the first to characterise the immune response um, to how the virus is cleared, which is really important in developing new vaccines. And this work was done, led by Catherine Kaczerska here, dressed um, in a gown to, to get um, her samples from liquid nitrogen. We're leading the largest national trial of antivirals for hospitalised patients called ASCOT. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And um, a number of groups have got um, a range of vaccine candidates, what I would call second and third generation vaccine candidates and developing antibodies for treatment. So, you know, the, the, um, the mobilisation of staff, um, the connection to the clinic, uh, the collaboration um, and the uh, passion that we've seen across the last nine months has actually been quite extraordinary and a great privilege to be leading this effort over the last, um, since February the 1st. So this is my favourite slide. Um, how happy were people to see this? Brilliant news for Melbourne. This comes from yesterday. Today's not quite as good, but still fantastic. You know, one new case, um, quite incredible of what Melbourne has endured and what we've achieved. But the question is what's next and what can we expect um, over the next 12 to 18 months? And I thought I'd tell you a bit about what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, a bit about treatment and diagnostics, because I want people to understand that these are both very important areas in seeing our way out of the pandemic. We talk a lot about vaccines, but um, we will have other ways out and um, even with the vaccine takes a while. And I hope my story about HIV convinced you of that. So non-pharmacological, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, and I think the big challenge in the coming 12 months is can they be refined? This is essentially what we did or what we know needs to be done test, trace and isolate, having a system that can pounce on any new infections and, and eliminate this, this spot fires. Hand hygiene, we've known for a while. Masks, we know they work. Physical distancing, limiting large gatherings. And then there are these more intrusive measures like closing restaurants, staying at home, curfews, school closures. And this is a really blunt instrument. Um, and I've used this term before, but effectively when Melbourne went into lockdown, you know, we threw the kitchen sink at it. We threw absolutely everything at it. And we don't really know which was the most important. Um, and we know that each of these work, um, but we really didn't know which was the most important. And that's why we're exiting lockdown quite slowly, peeling off some of these measures. I think all of this will be st staying for a while, but these are the ones that we're peeling off slowly um, to see if we can get back to fairly um, normal life. But probably one of the most important things is, is preventing super spreading events. And that's going to be absolutely key. Um, and how glad I was to hear about the Cox plate being reversed because super spreading events happen when you have large groups together. And I think that's going to be key to a pick which are the most important super spreading events and how to stop them. And there's some really nice data coming out of Hong Kong, which is very analogous to us. When we try and compare ourselves to other countries, we shouldn't be looking to the US and, and UK and Europe. They're totally different outbreaks. They're in a different, um, they're different um, planet from what we're trying to do. They're just trying to stop people getting into hospital and keeping their healthcare system alive. We're trying to eliminate virus in the community. And this just shows you what a super spreading event looks like. Basically, patient, um, 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 patient goes along to a bar, um, mixes with a large group of people in a bar. In the yellow dot, these are all the people that got infected that night. They all go home and infect someone in their family. 
And then you see there's not much transmission beyond these events because there isn't the opportunity for widespread um, spread. We don't know enough about super spreading events. Is it something unique about this patient? Is it something unique about the physical environment he or she was in? But actually what Hong Kong has discovered is that 70% um, of people don't actually transmit the virus to other people. So this is the number of secondary cases and the proportion of all onward transmissions. So this is zero secondary cases, haven't spread it to anyone, 70% of infections in Hong Kong spread it to one person, 20% of infections. So this is a really powerful way of saying most infections come from very few people. In fact, they estimate 20% of cases are responsible for 80% of transmissions. And these super spreading events occur socially and not at home. So it's these super spreading events we have to stop and we'll get better at the non-pharmaceutical interventions. I want to move now to therapeutics. Um, and this gives you a sort of outline of what um, happens when someone has COVID. On that y-axis is the severity of illness. And most people really only um, go in and out of stage one, meaning they get very mild symptoms and then they clear the virus. But some people progress to this much more severe disease. And if you look at the drivers for this, um, there's two phases. There's the viral phase where you've got lots of viral replication, really when you're, when you're really pretty well. And then something is triggered here to trigger this abnormal inflammatory response. And as what happens in most diseases, and actually this happened in HIV, when you start trying to find new treatments, you usually start with the sickest people. But the drugs that are going to work at this phase are probably quite different to what will work at this phase because the drivers of disease are very different in early and late stage disease. But most of the studies are all been directed here. So what do we know? What, what we, we know we've got some things that work. Um, we know that steroids work. They reduce mortality by about 20 to 30% for people with severe disease. Remdesivir is the antiviral drug. Um, it reduces time to recovery, nothing too flash. I'd say this is sort of an absolute first generation antiviral drug. We need something better. What's coming? Um, I think there's a lot of excitement about antibodies and I'll talk a bit about those. And also combination antivirals, again, a lesson from HIV. We know that viral drugs usually work better when you attack it from multiple sites, and this is, um, could be very relevant for COVID-19. What would be a game changer? If we had a cheap, oral, non-toxic antiviral, a bit like we have now for, for HIV, that we could use here um, that could reduce the chance of progression, and also reduce transmission because an antiviral should technically reduce the amount of virus you have in your nose. And we're, we're way off finding this, but this is something that we might see in the future. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about antibodies and combination antivirals. So um, antibodies are a really interesting um, new way to treat viral diseases. In fact, this whole pipeline of discovering them was um, was developed in HIV therapeutics and Ebola therapeutics. And basically it involves someone that has COVID-19, you collect blood from them and you can sort out um, for the non-scientists in the room, trust me, these are, part, these are cells that recognize part of the virus. You can basically fluorescently label them using a virus tag. And then you can actually get the genetic sequence from that cell and manufacture these antibodies. And they're extraordinarily good at blocking the virus from replicating. And what's really interesting about this is you could do this from any virus and you can make these antibodies very quickly and you know they're safe effectively because as opposed to drugs, um, all antibodies pretty much look the same. And there are multiple companies that have already developed these antibodies you would have heard of Regeneron because one famous man re received the Regeneron antibodies, but many other companies are making them. We have phase three clinical trials looking to see whether these antibodies work in mild to moderate disease, in people in hospital or as an outpatient. But these things have to go through clinical trials. And in fact, one of these antibodies that was looking at as the front runner from a company called Lilly, has recently been paused the study because of concerns around safety. 
But this is an exciting new approach. If we could make these very quickly and very fast, and you can actually even make these cheap, it's rapidly translatable to any, any infectious disease, particularly new viruses, so we could move on this very fast. And just a reminder that feeling good um, doesn't mean a drug or antibody works. It has to be answered in a clinical trial, and we still don't know the, antibody, the results to antibodies. So I certainly wouldn't be taking an antibody if I was to get COVID um, in the next few months, which I won't get, of course, because I'm going to be staying in Melbourne. Um, the other area is combination treatments. And this just shows you a bit like our, what I showed you for HIV. This is the amount of virus that's in someone's nose. And you can see here in this combination study, the details aren't that important. You can see that there's that once someone goes on the combination compared to a single drug, there's much less virus in the nose and you clear it quicker. And um, that's um, important because that would make you less infectious and it might stop you from getting sick. Um, this probably only will work in people that have had a short duration of symptoms. And um, we know that in this study, people came um, swab, had a quicker time to negative throat swab, and they had a shorter time to resolution of symptoms. And so if we had something that was cheap, oral, and could be used in everyone infected, this really could be a game changer, but we're way off from that. Um, we're currently running a very big clinical trial. It's being led by Steve Tong. It's called ASCOT. It's being run in Australia, New Zealand, and India. And we're actually looking to see if we can stop people from getting sick or progressing into intensive care. And um, it's a really interesting study because it can answer multiple questions at the same time. What's the best antiviral? What's the best antibody? And what's the best anticoagulant? Because people um, with SARS, with COVID-19, get um, increased blood clotting. And so in, you, you can come into this study and you could get an antiviral drug, you can get an antibody drug, or you could get anticoagulation. It allows us to answer multiple questions um, at the same time to see what might lead to better outcomes. And finally, there are some novel antiviral approaches, and I'll come back to gene therapy again. I've already told you about the Nobel Prize winners, but this time this is using gene therapy, the actual the gene therapy that Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna discovered called CRISPR. And um, many of you might know CRISPR-Cas9, which cuts DNA, but there's also a form of CRISPR-Cas9, there's also a different form that cuts RNA, um, and that just to remind you, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is an RNA virus. And we've been working with the group at Peter McCallum Hospital, seeing if we could destroy the um, COVID-19 um, genome, the RNA genome, as a therapeutic using CRISPR-Cas13. And indeed, in test tube models, we've been able to show we can do that if we design um, these, um, this uh, CRISPR to recognise parts of the COVID-19 virus. Just very quickly, I'll talk briefly on some diagnostics and um, vaccines and then wrap up. So at the moment, many of you will know you need to get a nose, nose, nose swab and, piece, and then a complicated test that takes 24 hours, maybe 48 hours to get the result. Can we do better? Well, first of all, I'm sure we can, and that is using saliva. So we traditionally take a nose swab. It's pretty uncomfortable, um, and um, you usually need someone else to do it for you. If you just spit into a pot at home and send it in, that would be an incredible advance. And we now know from work done both here at Royal Melbourne and in the US that, in fact, there's more virus in the saliva than in the nasopharyngeal swab. So this might be a much better way to um, diagnose COVID-19. And in fact, we're working at the moment with the Victorian government in a big rollout of saliva testing for people in high risk workplaces like the police, meat workers, Uber drivers, for example. And you'll hear more about that over the coming days. There's also rapid diagnostic tests. So, um, Rapid molecular tests, you, this is, you need a special machine about the size of a toaster, and this takes 30 minutes to get the result back, something that could be used in hospitals or nursing homes. But now the, there are these antigen tests where you don't need equipment at all, and you can get the result in 15 minutes. And people are worried about these tests not being sensitive enough, but if you actually look at people who have um, 
COVID-19 and measure how much virus is in the nose. It peaks just when symptoms come on and then it declines over the next two to three weeks. And if you use PCR, which is um, genetic code detection, um, it's got pretty low level sensitivity. The antigen tests are not as sensitive, but you're infectious only for a very pre brief period in this period that you're PCR positive. So an antigen test may well be um, suitable for um, diagnosing COVID-19. And again, these will be, could be used for um, businesses and um, also mimic what's happened in um, HIV testing. Finally, there are multiple vaccine platforms being used for SARS-CoV-2. This has been going at breakneck speed. Um, these are the different ways the vaccines are performed. Um, this is traditional vaccination using a protein. Most of our vaccines that you get in childhood are protein-based, or they might be virus-based, a weakened form of the virus. And these are new sort of vaccine approaches, something called nucleic acid or viral vectors. And it's important to point out that these have never been developed or commercialised into a vaccine. Um, this is the Oxford vaccine you would have read about, or Moderna the, from the US. They're the front runners, but they've never been um, in, in commercialised. We've got a huge number of vaccines being developed. Um, these are the first generation um, vaccines. Um, there are now six approved for limited use just in Russia and China, and 11 in large scale studies. But I think it's really important that you realise these are just first generation vaccines. Success defined by the WHO or the FDA is a reduction in disease by 50%, so not elimination. These vaccines, at least in animals, just protect against disease, not infection. So you, they stop virus replicating in the lungs, but not in the nose. So they won't stop transmission. Most of them need two doses, which is not ideal. And we have limited data in the elderly, children and pregnant people. And we don't know how long immunity lasts. This all sounds very negative, but just to tell you that the first generation vaccines will be far from perfect. And many experts are now saying, you know, first generation vaccines are only one tool in the overall public health response and unlikely to be the ultimate solution that many expect. So in closing, I'm talking about HIV and COVID, what are some lessons for success? Well, behavioural change was really important in HIV. Um, condoms, clean needles, um, clean blood supply. This was only achieved with community empowerment and engagement. And I imagine we're going to need a lot more of that in coming months. Less fines, less rules and more community empowerment. Both of these need strong public health systems. We need to test, trace and isolate, and that has to be in place. Um, it was established very well for HIV, but we, it's different types of um, strengthening for COVID-19. Um, science matters, without a doubt, HIV has been transformed by the science, but you need investment, collaboration, and you need the private sector. There are multiple biomedical interventions and it's not just about a vaccine. Innovations in testing and treatments will also transform COVID-19. And I think one thing we learnt very much in HIV is that you can't leave anyone behind. Um, health is a human right, so everyone um, in the world has act, should, should and must have access to all of this. And just in closing, um, I was lucky enough to join with um, um, some very close colleagues who I've worked with in the HIV area for a long time, talking about leveraging what we know from HIV for COVID. And we ended with the line that arguably the most important lesson of the HIV response is that no country could go it alone in bringing this deadly virus to its current state of a chronic treatable condition. We need to heed this lesson to avoid nationalistic responses that jeopardise global access to solutions and cannot succeed against a global pandemic. So as much as we are now thinking local, meaning thinking just about Melbourne, just about Victoria, just about Australia, you know, we really do need um, a global solution. So finally, I just want to acknowledge um, all of my colleagues um, in my own group um, working on HIV and now to a lesser extent uh, uh, COVID as well. Uh, many collaborators around the world, including um, partnerships with the HIV community, which I've had for many years. 
and all of our um, people working on and leading groups um, in COVID-19 and our many funders and end with this wonderful installation um, on Royal Parade, um, thanking all of our healthcare workers and scientists at the front line in the response to COVID. And I'll end there. Thanks very much, Guy. Well, thank you very much. What an amazing talk. Thank you very much. Um, so for those people that don't know, you can put questions into the Q&A. There's a uh, button at the uh, bottom right. And so we've, we've got a few already. So I thought might uh, pose them. One is from uh, Professor Francis Saparovich. Wants to ask whether you could discuss the relative cost of treatments, sort of antibodies versus combination antivirals, that sort of yeah, great, great question. Um, so, cost of antiviral treatments in Australia when drugs are not off patent is about $25,000 a year. If you do the cost effectiveness, unbelievably cost effective because most people with HIV are young and have a future of work, highly cost effective. Now, getting that into um, low and middle income countries is impossible. So what was done was an agreement to drop the patent restrictions for low and middle income countries for HIV drugs. So HIV drugs are now available in low and middle income countries for about $100 a year. So you can treat someone with HIV for $100 a year. We pay a lot of money in Australia. Once it's off patent, it becomes cheap. But if we want the best drugs, we pay a lot of money. But if you live in South Africa, it's $100 a year. Antibodies are, will probably be about the same cost, but we will probably need a two-tiered system um, like we have for HIV drugs, which basically set the benchmark for how to make new treatments global. Um, actual dollar amount, I can't tell you. I can tell you, though, that the um, cost for treating COVID-19 with remdesivir, that was the um, pretty crappy antiviral drug that I mentioned, is about two and a half thousand dollars. The real cost of that drug is seven dollars. So uh, eventually, um, and, the, and, the, and the company that makes that drug is Gilead, who were very active in um, the whole HIV antiviral story. So I imagine in the future, if we get successful COVID treatments, we would have a two tier system of expensive in high income, cheap in low income countries. And because um, I mentioned in my talk that there has been a lot of work on HIV antibodies um, for years. A lot of the technologies that we use are being now used for COVID antibodies were developed for HIV antibodies. And um, so there's a very strong awareness in the HIV world that you have to be able to get these drugs cheap and available. And so I'm optimistic they could probably be quite cheap. And one last, quick, last little point is that remember for COVID-19, you just need one shot of an antibody and you'll be, you'll be covered for five to 10 days. In the HIV, it's different because you need the antibodies forever. Yeah, no, it's, um, well, certainly the, uh, the numbers that you mentioned, you know, what was it, four people out of 37 million, the odds for HIV seem particularly uh, bad. Um, I have another question here from uh, Emily McGann, where you mentioned the Hong Kong stats where 70% people didn't infect. Is that due to, lockdown restrictions or the inherent infectivity of the virus? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I imagine it's a bit of both because even in a lockdown, um, most people will interact with one other person or multiple people, at least in your home. Um, there's no doubt that the highest risk of getting infection was share it being, um, sharing a house with someone. There's, that's, that's a high receptivity. But I'd imagine it's a bit of both. So um, it's it's it, uh, it, it was probably lockdown because you've got less opportunity um, to um, remember. You don't infect every single person you see. You infect um, they uh, you know the, the the initial calculations for what's called that you may many people don't talk about this much now. The R zero, the number of people that each person infects um, before lockdown was about two to three. And then we want to get it to less than one. So um, the lockdowns do it affect how many people you come in contact with, for sure. Um, very good. Another question here from Professor Andrew Holmes. Uh, he understands that the Moderna RNA vaccine needs to be handled at dry ice temperature. So how could that be cold chain be 
constructed to deliver doses to a large population or is there other ways to go around that? Yeah, that's, um, that's a def there's real issues about delivery um, and RNA, the Moderna RNA vaccines also got real issues about manufacturing. Um, and I often get asked this question about the, whether we will have access to that vaccine. At the moment, we wouldn't have the ability to, we don't have that ability in Australia to manufacture an RNA vaccine. I think there are other, we will get innovations in the delivery of RNA to make it more stable. Um, which may not require the cold chain. But at the moment, in the first generation vaccines, not ideal and it will be very difficult to get global delivery of that vaccine. And so how do you think the, because obviously you were, you mentioned that the, when the vac, there's the vaccine sort of just one way, but you've, you've got all these time points as well in that when you first get the infection and when later, how are those going to be, uh, I mean, how are you going to, test for that i mean is that i mean when you know um trying to find a particular vaccine that, or a particular uh, effect at an early or a late time point is that i mean right yes no the early sorry, i'm not explaining myself very well no 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 i get what you mean i think I'm, i might have confused you the early and late time points in the course of disease is relevant yep. for treatment and antivirals for a vaccine, you want to prevent anyone even getting into that stage because a vaccine, actually it is, it, 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 I made the point at the end that the vaccines that are being developed currently, if you test them in a animal model, a monkey or a hamster, and then you challenge with the virus, in the vaccinated animals, there's less virus in the lungs, but similar virus in the nose. So you don't stop people's noses from getting infected, but you stop their lungs from getting infected. So they, they don't no longer get sick, but they will still be infectious. As opposed to measles, like the vaccines that we're used to, like measles vaccine, it will stop you getting infected. It, you never actually, so the measles is never transmitted. And that that's another thing that I don't think the public understand that the vaccine will help disease, which is really important, but it will still, you will still get transmitted. And what your what 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 and maybe what what might happen is you have a shorter duration of, of illness or you 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 just have that vir that viral phase and you never go into the immunological phase. Very good. There's uh, the number of questions is increasing. <laughs> um, right. Where should we go next? Um, Yes, sort of a more general question from uh, uh, Joe. Any comment on the logistical side of manufacture and distribution of vaccines and therapeutics? Um, hugely important. Um, many of you will have read that some vaccines are already being manufactured at scale. So um, the Oxford vaccine, which has been developed by AstraZeneca, have already made billions of doses so that if it's shown to be effective, those doses could be rapidly mobilised. And the Australian government's already done a deal to make sure they can have access to the Oxford vaccine. Um, we also have the capabilities to, in Australia, we have got CSL, which is incredible, who one of the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world, um, right here down the road in Melbourne. They can make, they are planning to make the Oxford vaccine. You would have heard about the Queensland vaccine, um, and but that's a way off that hasn't yet been into big clinical trials so we wouldn't be getting that until the end of next year so how quickly you can access the that how quickly each country can access the vaccine um, depends a little bit about their local manufacturing capacity but I think what and I was getting this at, to this at the end of it we have to stop probably worry maybe not as we don't might not need to vaccinate everyone in Australia to have a big effect you know we might need to vaccinate 20 percent of people at highest risk of getting severely sick and so that's why we've joined something called COVAX which is a international kind of vaccine um, consortium where a lot of countries have put in money and then um, COVAX will purchase these vaccines and just try and distribute them fairly around the world, which is probably, a much, not probably, I'm sure is a much better way than each government trying to, you know, do its own deal. But, you know, um, there's pressure for governments to do things like what our government has done. 
Yeah. So I think what, one last question um, was from Lauren about sewage testing for COVID-19, because that's sort of come in the news. What does it involve and is HIV also detectable in sewage? Um, so sewage testing for uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, is a really, really sensitive way of detecting an early outbreak. It's not very useful when you've got transmission because it's going to be positive. So although we transmit SARS-CoV-2 by um, breathing on people and droplets and aerosol spread, most people also excrete it from the bowel. And so therefore it's quite, it will be very valuable right now in Melbourne where we'll, we, if we've eliminated community transmission, they will effectively should see the sewage negative and if there's early detection warning that there's transmission that we haven't picked up clinically for whatever reason, the storage should become positive. It's being done right now, actually, um, in Melbourne. Melbourne Water are doing the testing. It's pretty st standard, basically the same genetic test that you do on throat swabs you do on storage. HIV, no. HIV is a bloodborne virus, so it only gets transmitted by blood um, and sexual secretions, not, um, not through the bowel. Excellent. Well, I think we've worked you very hard this <laughs> evening. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, thank you very much once again for um, uh, agreeing to give uh, such a very interesting lecture. And um, it's, uh, no, it's been a real pleasure. And I'd also like to thank all the people that turned up. We had a very good, I think we had 250 at the um, high point. Um, and that was, um, that's been really quite uh, amazing. Um, so I'd like to thank you once again. I'd also like to just uh, mention finally, I'm just going to share uh, my screen um, just to quick uh, advertising for the uh, next uh, lecture, uh, which will be on the 11th of November. And this will be by uh, Professor Ian Ray. And it sort of nicely links to what Richard was mentioning at the beginning. But in 1921, uh, David Ormasson uh, suggested a different name for the proton, which uh, was not taken up. Um, and this will be uh, discussed by uh, Professor Ian Ray uh, on the 11th of May. And here's the, um, how you can uh, uh, register for that. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring this meeting to a close. And uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, your participation. Thank you. <laughs>